Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz alto saxophonist, composer, and arranger Logan Richardson. Talking to Logan in his current home of Paris, France, he opened up about his latest critically acclaimed album, Shift, released in 2016. He also elaborated on growing up in Kansas City, playing with Harold O'Neill at Paseo High, Saturday classes at the American Jazz Museum, and meeting and learning from cats like Max Roach at the same time. He spent some quality time in New York City after growing up in Kansas City and has some thoughts on this jazz town that he grew up in. He comes back to KC and he did in May of 2016 to play at the Blue Room and to record with Herman Mahari on his first solo album. There was much traction covered in our interview, so get to know Logan and dig this interview, my friends. Hey, Logan, it's a, it's a big honor to speak with you. Thank you for taking some time to talk with me today. I appreciate it. Oh, man, it's a pleasure. Thanks for being interested. Right on, man. So how is Paris this morning? It is uh, gray and gloomy and raining currently. Uh, seems to have been the, uh, the, the climate for the last, uh, oh, goodness, I don't know, maybe month. Because, you know, obviously they had the flooding here a few weeks ago or a couple weeks ago. I was actually in the States then, so I missed that. But apparently um, the rain has not ceased, so... That's not totally awesome, but, uh, you know, Paris is Paris. Even when it's like this, it still has its uh, type of charm, I suppose. Yeah. So, I don't know. I find myself to be such a child of the sun to where it's like I really need the sun, man. It's, it's uh, you know, it can be not, not depressing, but, you know, I don't know. It's, it's de-something whenever uh, <laughs> the sun's not around. So, yeah, but it's cool. It's cool. Everything's good. Right on. Yeah, you know, we're actually getting ready here in Kansas City to enter into that historic June drought period. It's going to be 97 to 100 something for like the next two weeks. Oh, wow. So it's, and, and I need the sun too, man. I, I think about Seattle and Portland climates and I'm like, not me, not at all. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, it, it's, it's too bad because I I like elements about, other, you know, there's always like, you always have to, to give up one thing to be able to get another thing. But man, I, I have to admit, I think I would take some hot, humid weather right now a little bit you know what i mean you know not not a a, a long period of time but man it's, it would be better than this because it's just kind of uh i don't know it, it's fine though it's yeah fine. cool man cool well i'm gonna go ahead and dive right in here i'm gonna kick it off and ask you about this phenomenal album shift there's such an evolution not only of you and your career but of jazz and i want to ask you how do you feel about this record uh, uh, great question. Um, you know, this this album for me, it, it meant a lot. Like all of my projects, and typically anything I've you know involved myself in, I've, I've typically cared about it and wanted to be there. And with this one, it was a little bit different because uh, it was my third project, and I had more or less formulated the configuration of the band and just the kind of the concept for the music and whatever since two thousand and nine. Uh, it's just that. Um, between, you know, at this point, I've been living in New York for about nine years. Uh, I, uh, you know, it, 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 by the next year, I was getting ready to uh, to leave, unbeknownst to me. Um, and I, you know, kind of moved. I was still, I was leaving the Inner Circle Music labels, and I wanted, like, a, a different label. Even if it was a, a independent label, I still wanted one that was more uh, having the function of, like, this stereotypical... Uh, nostalgic idea of how a record company is supposed to function. Um, and so, you know, I started talking to Concord, uh, you know, and, and so many th things happened, you know, that led to the next collective thing. I moved to Europe in the process, uh, uh, and the whole time I still had this project. And, and that's really still the point is, is that it, it just kind of uh, stood the time of like the time of simply waiting. Uh, getting people's schedules coordinated because obviously with everyone involved, it's, uh, you know, uh, certain people are, are booked out at least a year. Most people are booked out at least that far ahead. And then Pat typically it was always about two years. Uh, so it was, uh, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of things. Um, and to finally get to a point to where uh, the album just got recorded was a huge uh, uh, platform. But then at this time, uh, 
I was basically, uh, 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 I had an option with Concord, and I kind of uh, wiggled out of that uh, between them not taking the option and then me just not wanting to be there anymore, um, to where I just had the master of this album, and no label, no nothing, and this would have been about February of last year. And so, uh, you know, in the process of my, my travels coming to Europe, I've been fortunate to be able to kind of, um, uh, well, I imagine since I've spent so many years in New York, and New York is kind of a place where many people from around the world move there, and then they, you know, you have the scene of, like, musicians from all around the world internationally. I figured since I lived here in Paris, I would, instead of trying to go with this local idea of working, uh, like, you know, living in Paris and go here, go here in town, I said, well, why not just run to Italy for a day, go to Berlin, go to, you know, and treat Europe kind of like a local team. So I started, you know, took some time, but I started meeting some cats and uh, people I like their music, and then we get together and do their thing. So uh, this led to, uh, you know, working with an Italian artist, got me over to uh, Tokyo for the first time, and I met the president of distribution for Universal Music. So anyway, uh, it, it just turned about to be become a series of things to where everything worked out the way it was supposed to work, um, because not only the model in, in regards to like whatever could be perceived musically or um uh, you know, uh, stylistically, or or uh, in regards to the tradition of of trying to honor and 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 stand firmly on the shoulders of uh, the forefathers that have laid uh, the path before me and and everyone else that's aspiring to do this the same thing. It, it, it's necessary to also push the platform forward in regards to how this music is being put out and the types of relationships uh, that are being established uh, verbally, uh, uh, socially, and actually logistically, contractually, and whatnot. I couldn't stand for the idea of going through all of this, doing an album like this, of, uh, you know, uh, fighting all types of wind. I mean, really, my whole career has always been kind of feeling like I have, like, a tornado in front of me. Uh, but it always gave me kind of, like, this premonition of knowing that's because I'm I'm making some way in regards to to pushing forward, and so that and really that equalization has never ended. It's always been this kind of uh, equaled out balance of um, of um, fighting and pushing, you know, whatever kind of uh, adjective or, 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 or verb uh, that needs to be applied to uh, to the action of, of of what it is. That's that's essentially what it's been, and I think that this album for me was a, a huge testament to. to seen that many different things were possible in regards to a strong contrast as to what a general public uh, would have thought uh, was possible. And that comes down to even the way that my contract is, is done up, uh, my ownership of everything, uh, you know, major label, major label signing, all these things. But yet I'm totally free because uh, I own my master. I own my publishing. I have no 360 deal. Um, and in fact, I'm actually, I have more, everyone is like on as a partner as far as I'm concerned, because it's, um, you know, it, it, being a, a musician seems to be so much like being a magician. And so much of uh, the physical, uh, actual tangible things that we claim or we actually get come from the elaborate nature of the illusions that can be cast. And, you know, then there's a thin line to say, well, is the illusion not the actuality or the actual physical product? It is. And in moments, maybe it isn't. But if everyone thinks it is, then it becomes it is. And so it's like this thing. So for me, it's actually really crazy because as much of an illusion that I would ever like to cast, I suppose that's there. But all the physical, tangible things are there, too. But then there's like this underworking to where... No one would ever really actually know, but this isn't like a normal situation because I'm, I own everything and I'm, I have a, my agreement is they have to come to me and ask permission for me if they can continue to press shift and put it out internationally for as long as they would like to do that. Um, they own nothing. And so for me, this is a model of the modern day thing. To have the opportunity to be a part of this rich legacy of this label, this, this, it, it means so much that it's, uh, it's too much almost to, uh, to focus in on and say, wow, I'm on it. It's better just to try to, I don't know, respect everyone that have laid this path for me to be able to have the opportunity and figure out, well, how can I do something that can contribute to everything else that I feel like I've been given and I'm forever going to be in debt to. And part of that is changing the way that the, the record 
contract is set up um, to be able to actually function for the artist and to make sure that the art can continue to live and, and be changed if it, if it wants to be changed and presented differently if it wants to be presented differently without having to ask permission from anyone. Uh, because it is our, 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 our product. Well, there's no better way to do that than with uh, uh, this band who, uh, you know, somebody would have said, oh, Jason Moran and Pat Metheny together. Oh, I can't imagine what that's going to, is that going to, I mean, and they're playing Logan Richardson's music. Wow. Okay. How's that going to do that? Because, you know, he plays all this brainy, uh, 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 meter music. So, you know, and these are like things that not everyone's going to think, but I've heard these things from people. I've heard almost these types of things from people. So I know kind of what a, a stereotype of it could be. And I loved it because, these these gentlemen, you know, they got into the studio and with a you know really a quick six hour rehearsal uh, the day before, um, most of what we took or most of what I ended up keeping for the album were like first takes with no overdubs at all. And so, honestly, what I think everyone's getting from this album is something that is um, that is just as new as it was for us to be able to essentially be in the playground together and and and. Uh, and, 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 and create, you know, and, 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 and fill out one another. And it was documented at the same time that it was happening. Um, and, and we recorded together all within 24 hours of actually playing together for the first time. So what everybody's really hearing is this kind of excitement that comes whenever you believe in what it is that these artists have given us to believe. I mean, from what I've heard from Pat Metheny since I was 16 years old, um, He's someone that I would never be able to peg him as being just this or just that. He does anything. He's like a chameleon. You put him in any situation, he's going to be in there and he's going to kill it more than anyone else just, just because that's what he is. I mean, he's, he's prepared for anything. Jason the same way, Nasheed the same way, Harris. So even if they say, oh, well, we don't imagine them, I'd hire all these guys to do a standards album. I mean, a straight standard would play it. All the things you are, a Stella by Starlight, and it would be amazing. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, for sure. So it's like, for me, but it's crazy because some people say, oh, man, well, I'm not sure if Jason Moran even really can. Can not she play four on the floor and two two and four on the high? Of course they can. But because they play a certain thing or they have a certain book or a certain project, sometimes people are disillusioned by what's actually possible. So for me, I thought they were the most perfect people to have because first, it's, it's a dream because I... I you know, I love all of them. And um, what I knew that they would be able to bring without me having to say anything, basically, I just put the music in front of them, give them a couple of descriptive things in terms of some shapes for the tunes, and there you go. Um, you know, true professionals, true masters. And um, for me, it's it's a, a great experience to be able to have a project but yet be the, the total pupil at the same time of... Uh, uh, learning how to be a professor from the professors that you have in your in your band and whatnot. It's you beautiful. Know? Yeah, that's beautiful too that you have full control. I love that, man. When the artists can be in control of their destiny and, and run it, that's that's beautiful. Well, I think you know honestly what I found too. You know because the only reason that it went that way, probably. I mean, had you caught me and see, that's a beautiful thing as why well. I was fortunate that it actually took as long as it did and patience prevailed because it was like. Uh, had you come to me three years ago and been like, okay, they want to put it out, they want to bob, they're going to need X percentage, basically own the master. I would say, okay, probably, you know, but I kept learning. I kept checking shit out. I kept checking out royalties, mechanical rights, uh, uh, digital rights, the difference between this, all these organizations that are set around and really put together this physical funnel. And I went through this period where I really was, you know, uh, had this notebook writing down all this shit, really trying to figure it out. And when I figured out what was going on, uh, man, the biggest illusion is the one that they make artists think uh, and how cats do so much out here and they have no idea the systems that have already been designed and set in place just for them to collect, whether they're a side man, a leader, an owner, not an owner, whatever. And it it gets so deep that when I started seeing this, I said, oh, shit. I mean, a, a record label is nothing without their distribution. Yeah. Oh, well, guess what? Universal Music owns EMI, who owns Blue Note, and they own Verve, and they own... So for them, record labels are essentially like dresses. Yeah. So they say, okay, we want to distribute your set. Okay, so now what label do we want to put it on? So you get your choice of label. 
Yeah. Say, it could have been any label I wanted. I just said, you know, oh, Blue Note's good. You know, so the funny thing is that no one looks at it this way. It's all the A&R guy. Well, the A&R guy can't do anything unless distribution says. So all of these things go into shift. It may sound really wide and spam, but for me, shift is in everything. It's in bringing this group of people together and playing this type of original music and having to be fresher than it would have even sounded with a young band that would have seemed to be the one that would have uh, uh, played it in a certain way or whatever, you know? Uh, you have a shift in digital technology uh, into where now everything that we've known completely is not applicable to like how things actually function. It's only like kind of a mere template of how we're trying to give a bit of morality to like digital presence in terms of its digital meeting a physical kind of thing. And so shift for me means, you know, it has so many different um, uh, meanings. You know, I've shifted my uh, physical inhabitants in regards to being in the States, moving to Europe, you know, learning these different languages, trying to get inside of this, this uh, culture, basically having nothing in terms of uh, roots so much, except for the bit of touring I did before, you know, so kind of renegade style a bit i mean th because this is what's necessary for me to break out this idea of how uh shit has been snagged back into the uh uh not back into it's been just taken from the street put into the schools that's not necessarily a bad thing having uh, uh, the music in the school but when that became like the full culture of it i think people started losing uh, the identity of kind of like the actual true uh, uh culture and, and lineage and kind of uh, camaraderie that happens in regards to, uh, and respect, submission to the music. Submission, you submit, you give yourself. This isn't about me or you, it's about us. And it's about how can we continue this and everyone takes their place in regards to how they can help uh, the function of the of, of this thing you know some people nobody ever knows some people never left the town they were from but they're a legend there and they are quite possibly one of the baddest motherfuckers ever but no one would ever known but did they care about that no they knew their stance in the music and it was their job to bring someone along to to be able to sacrifice what they could have done for what it is that they were already doing and had already done and that's a deep uh it's just, it's, it's, it's deep, and I think that a lot of that isn't so part of that is shit. You know, I'd rather talk about the tradition and Charlie Parker and Cannonball Adderley all day long uh, before talking about, you know, how my shit is different and how it's, because that's going to be something that's subjective, and people are going to make up their own mind about that anyway. So, and whatever's obvious is already obvious. If it's not, then it's nothing. I mean, I... I I, to, to shape someone's idea of what shifted that's why when they said well, what is shift you know what is that when i i even did this uh that the epk interview it was kind of i don't know i have to leave it open-ended because if i tell you it's this then it's already done so what are you entering into you yeah. don't want to enter into something that's already finished so you know i don't know no i dig it dude that that makes total sense so speaking of the massive shift, geographically obviously you've gone from kansas city new york paris and as a growth mechanism, you've grown so much over the years since Kansas City. So let's go back to Kansas City. Talk about growing up in Kansas City. Man, you know, life was a uh, was an interesting time growing up in Kansas City because um, I was born in 1980 and uh, I grew up on East 55th Street, so basically almost at the corner of uh, 55th Street and Soul Parkway, so east of Truce, and. Um, you know, that, that period, definitely in like the, the mid to late 80s and the 90s, I mean, uh, you know, Kansas City was definitely like the murder capital a couple of times. And a lot of those murders were happening all within like uh, uh, segments and regions all around where I grew up. And so it's interesting because I still live an extremely sheltered life. So it's like, you know, uh, I knew things were going on, but I was always uh, essentially fairly protected, you know, uh, I grew up in a, in a house where I would say no one was an artist, but kind of everyone was. Uh, uh, you know, everyone always listened to music, uh, you know, watched a lot of movies. Uh, you know, my brother, second oldest brother was a, you know, a, a visual artist, so he always drew uh, super raw and natural, but really, really great artist. Uh, my oldest brother was a scholar, uh, you know, uh, he you know, ended up you know, having a couple of masters, and he's a Rhodes Scholar, and went to Oxford and Harvard, and, you know, a uh, really brilliant dude. Uh, my sister, you know, in her own respect, same thing, and, you know, everyone had their, their thing, so it's like, as a kid, I guess I grew, and I was the youngest of uh, four kids, um, and, you know, it's like nine years older, eight years older, and four and a half years older, so significantly enough to where any one of them could have been my, like, uh, kind of surrogate parent in a way. 
so highly influenced by many people and um I was just always kind of into music, you know. I, I never really identified this uh, until I, I, I suppose hindsight, meaning now or maybe some years prior to now. But uh, you know, I would make mixed tapes from thirty threes and forty fives, and uh, you know, I think uh, my brother used to give me kind of mixed tapes because he was always really into music, and I think he wanted to be a musician, but he just never his mind didn't think like that. His mind thought more in terms of like you know language and, and other things like this. So I don't know. I, I, I guess it was kind of a similar life as if I was grown around artists only. There was never any pressure or even any, uh, I don't know, want to say direct encouragement. There was encouragement, but only once I actually made a decision to do it. Then it was like, okay, he's doing this, so we'll support him. But not really saying, oh, well, why don't you go over here and take some piano lessons or something like this. So in any case, I grew up that way. Uh, Somehow had the idea I wanted a saxophone for years. I bugged my mom for one, don't know where it came from. Uh, finally, you know, found my way to getting one uh, and never really put it down from, from about 14, you know. So it's so my life really was kind of, uh, you know, when I was little, I wanted to be a baseball player. So, um, and it could have been, now I think about it now, maybe it's because the Royals won the World, you know, Series in 85 and. I'm sure that had some type of uh, conscious or subconscious effect. So at least for, you know, until I was about 12 or 13, that's what I was. I wanted to do. I wanted to play right field and, uh, and fucking be a slugger at the same time. <laughs> uh, and that, that's what I wanted to do. And it just, you know, and then, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, it was really how it happened. Uh, I was in um, going to Westport Middle High, uh, Westport Middle School. And I was in the, what, the uh, seventh grade, and I was supposed to have gym, because at this point, you didn't really pick your classes yet. They just give them to you based off a of curriculum you have to have. And I was supposed to have gym, but I ended up in band class. And because I always kind of like music, I was like, oh, let me, I'll stand here, you know. And so the first thing he asked me, I was 12, you know, I was like, he's like, what do you want to play? He asked everybody, I want to play saxophone. He's like, oh, well, you know, a bunch of saxophone players already have some, they already play on huh? So he basically the band director made me play flute, and so uh, just because I like music, I was like, you know, whatever, I'll play flute. I didn't know how to read music, so I stayed after school, learned how to play and read music at the same time. And I didn't practice the flute because I, I didn't want to play it basically, but just because I like music, I just I got better just between class and staying after school. And, so I, I became better than all the, the little girls that were actually playing flute and they were more advanced than me at a point, but it only took about a semester. And so then I started playing like the lead flute part, you know, and getting fucked with by the big fat tuba players and going through the whole thing. Um, and then, you know, 13 years old, I kept playing flute just because I was there in eighth grade, but I, the whole time I wanted to switch to saxophone. And my best friend behind me, this is actually a funny story, actually. Really, I have to interject this. The dude that sit behind me in seventh grade uh, and eighth grade, uh, he uh, uh, played out some saxophone, and I would always look back at the horn. Uh, so he's the one that uh, the summer of eighth grade let me borrow his saxophone for a month when I was still thirteen. Um, and so I, he did that. Then I went to uh, Westport High School my freshman year of high school uh, in ninth grade. Then I switched to Paseo Academy the tenth grade until I graduated. But that's when I went to high school. I got the school issued you know, uh, saxophone. I lied and told him I already played saxophone. Then I just had to take a fingering chart home and learn how to play really fast. But the point being, the guy that sat behind me ended up working, he ended up working for uh, NBC in Kansas City, and he's doing, like, all the technical uh, whatever in the room. So he just recently, when I was back there a couple of weeks ago, got me on the uh, morning show to uh, to play on NBC uh, uh, before the, 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 the day of the gig. And uh, it was just interesting because he had that same horn that he let me borrow because he had me sign the horn. So it was just really crazy. I mean, because this just happened a month ago. So it was, it was really crazy to hold and touch that horn, which was like the first one. Yeah. That's really, cool, yeah, man. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, for that, sure. That's so very cool. That was Kansas City. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of dig a little bit more into Kansas City. You go to Paseo High and you're a part of a group with Harold O'Neill. What were those days playing with Harold and being a part of the Paseo Academy like for you? Oh, it was crazy. Because um, I remember, you know, it's funny. I remember the time when, when Harold came in and he didn't play piano. Um, you know, it was like he played kind of, but he was just kind of getting into jazz and whatever. But, you know, it's like the way his mind works. It's like if Harold sets his mind to anything, he's basically going to do it at like a semi-pro level. 
after about six weeks um, and be competing like after about three months, you know. Um, so he was super, you know, uh, lightning fast in terms of just like picking up everything, just a total sponge. And um, it was interesting because, uh, you know, when I came in, you know, I, at that point I've been playing longer than he had been playing. Um, but we kind of still hit like really learning jazz and getting into the same things around the same period. I mean, I had like a little bit of a jump start, but only probably by a series of months. And um, he, um, you know, considering how accelerated he is in terms of everything, um, he just picked up so much. And then, you know, he started transcribing like Herbie Han- like full Herbie Hancock CDs, like note for note, like uh, every song. Uh, you know, after about a year of like really getting into, so it was just you know really crazy. And Kenny Kirkland and like you know all these these different uh, people like this, um, and so it was amazing because you know being there under Clarence Smith, uh, we um, or Mr. Smith as we call him and called him, um, he uh, I don't he was had such an encouraging way of pulling out everything that you had inside of you. And only referencing, like, uh, the great people who were from the place that you were from, but not ever saying be like that. Just saying, like, uh, like pay attention to how they do that. And that makes a huge difference because you find yourself inside of, like, that thing they're doing, and then you have a way of putting it out. So he had a very unique way of being able to draw out the individual person without any hampering of, uh, of, of being this or being that. Um, and only introducing us to hip shit, like, you know, weather report and, and, uh, you know, but at the same time, turn us on to Basie and then they're bringing in like Paquito De Rivera and, and Kenny Burrell and Jimmy Heath and, and Max Roach. And, you know, I mean, but when the time I came through Kansas city is a time that I'm pretty sure it didn't really, it, it's a time that hasn't existed since it was a really being young and being 14 to about 19 years old in those five years, there was a lot of really serious stuff happening. Man, I, it seems like a dream almost now, like the, just the amount of people I had a chance to be around and the, the instructors that I had, because they had a way of once again, pulling out, you know, like a Ahmad Aladdin, the same thing They uh, Gerald Dunn, you know, just the same. He was actually like my first uh, teacher that came to my house uh, and was giving me lessons, like, right before I started taking with uh, Aladdin. Um, so it was like, uh, these people that, that that now I can look back at it, and even in a moment, I think I knew it, to where they just extracted the best that you were. And it was never about, like, being anything else other than yourself, but understanding and having total respect for the tradition. You know, the other thing that you did at the same time at Paseo is that you took Saturday classes at the American Jazz Museum, from what I understand, like you said, with Max Roach, there were a lot of cats that were coming through. How influential were those sessions for you? Oh, man, that that was absolutely uh, uh, like a swirl. Like, everything was almost completely s- uh, surreal, even when you weren't even exactly sure who these people were, uh, like, to, to the fullest extent, you know, because, you know, not everyone that's a master that comes through, you, you're you totally hip to, just like everything. So, uh, but every time, you always knew but, I mean, for me, considering how much of a, a, a bird fanatic I already automatically was from about 14, it I knew who Max Roach was because, you know, uh, he played drums with, with Charlie Parker. And uh, I checked out via Charlie Parker recordings a bunch of Max Roach. And uh, so he was the first clinician that I ever had when I was uh, 15 years old. And this was, like, at the Kansas City Jazz Institute. And that was, that predates actual the actual jazz museum because... Because it was in the Lincoln Building, which across the, which is across the street, and at that moment they only had blueprints that were photocopied off, showing everybody what the Jazz Museum was going to look like. I used to play Little League in Parade Park, which sits, which is where the museum sits now. And that community center used to be like closer up. They moved the community center back, so I remember I played baseball on that land before the American Jazz Museum was there, and before I ever went to that institute or even played an instrument. Uh, or the saxophone, you know what I mean? So wow. that's the thing for me that's deep because I was already in that place on that land uh, be- because of what I thought it was, but it was all a draw for this because I always have remained on that land ever since. That institute was a, a month-long institute, which is where you we did it for a month. They brought in all these, I think they brought in, who's it was, uh, that first year it was Max Roach. The second one was Shirley Scott. 
The third one was um, Jimmy Owens, and then they brought in Bobby Watson for the last one. And then the next year, it was like, uh, oh, man, I forget who they brought in. It, you know, it was nothing but just like, you know, Toshigo Akiyoshi, uh, uh, like I said, Fakito de Rivera. Uh, during the year, they brought in Jimmy Heath, where he did something at the school, where we did something small group and big band. With Jimmy He, so I got to play like quintet with Jimmy. I mean, just like crazy, crazy shit. I mean, it's when I, when I think about it now, uh, to be like 16, 17 years old, not to mention we were gigging all the time. So, you you know, that's like you saying this whole thing with Harold, because Harold was a part of all these things. So everything I'm talking about, he was there. Uh, minus the first one with Max Roach. He wasn't in that institute, but that's what I mean. That's like we met in that next school year, because I think he transferred from another school or something like that. So I think the year after that and every other year, Harold was in the, the, the institute with us. And, you know, all, and, the, and these are the, the clinicians that they brought in, but the core teachers that they have were like Ahmad Ali Dean. Uh, uh, who else did they have? James Ward, Lewis Neal, who was my middle school teacher, who's the one that started me on flute, is the one who everything was always connected. And that's the thing that's like really crazy. No matter how far it seemed it got, it was the dude that started me on flute is the one who was the curator of the, the first year of the Jazz Institute, who was also the guy who I played in his first uh, big band when I was playing second alto, then eventually lead alto. And the same guy that wouldn't let me play alto, then eventually later he said, yeah, well, you know, I knew you were always going to play saxophone, so I knew you needed to double. Well, at least that's a good excuse that he can pull up later. But in any case, it worked. And so it's, it's really interesting looking at how everything was always connected. Um, when I sat in this middle school uh, room, I didn't know what all these LPs, he had the whole room lined with LPs. He looked up, it was like Oliver Nelson, it was uh, John Coltrane, Blue Train. It was nothing but jazz LP. I didn't know shit about jazz. He didn't teach us jazz. It was wind ensemble. Uh, so it's, uh, nothing's, nothing's, uh, nothing was, uh, 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 everything was already drafted, you know. It was just a matter of, uh, I don't know, following the path more or less, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, when you look back on your career, you've evolved so much. You've moved on so much. What was the advantage of learning jazz in Kansas City? Well, I think the thing, well, you know, it's actually interesting you say that because for me, I just grew up and I loved it and respected it, of course, but I never realized kind of like that this special pedigree that's happening there. Because just even when it's just coming down to the blues, I never took it for granted, like uh, understanding and feeling it and knowing what it is. But man, it's like I really don't now. Because I, I, it's funny how much of a, uh, I don't want to say a commodity, but like how much of like a valued, uh, which I guess is more or less kind of the same thing. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like, it's not everyone can do it. Um, and, and, but everyone understands what it is, even whether they like it or they don't. Because being able to actually do that is not a simple thing. And it's nothing that you can easily imitate. Um, even though for me, I thought that it was adaptable because I came up and if I was hearing jazz, I was definitely hearing an equal amount of blues and rock and roll and all types of things like this. Because, you know, Kansas City's heavily like a rock and roll and blues town. And so, and especially when I was coming up, the jazz scene was still going through that transition. So really many of the things that were riding were like the, even smooth jazz too, or the church slash smooth jazz. So you had a lot of that, that, that kind of stuff going on and, um, which still incorporated a lot of the blues. Um, and a lot of the artists that were playing on the upright, you know, playing straight ahead or whatever would play electric and some of these other, so you would be able to hear kind of like, uh, uh, these influences kind of like, uh, coming across, a, 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 a grid, so to speak. For me, I, I I don't know. It just seemed normal. But now being out here is like, oh man, you really have some soul. You really have some. I it, that's great. I mean, it's awesome. But I think for me, it's like one of the the most uh, beautiful things that came from coming up in this town because it's such a funky, blues filled, raw kind of uh, very very like uh, root earth oriented place. That if you're from there. I think it's almost hard to escape having that directly as a, a, a part of your genetic, you know, because I, I never feel like I even really had to even like that kind of count Basie the way Basie specifically lays back on the beat versus even the way the Ellington band versus, uh, you know, Stan Kenton or, or something like this. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm totally coming from like the Basie school, like just a way to lean so far back, but then also a way to have the beat be on another side. Where it's still laying back, but it's not pushing, but it's kind of in the middle. You know, it's like you can do these things with the beat. And Kansas City has a really beautiful way that, like, in a beautiful beat that really only exists uh, in in that town specifically. Not even just the Midwest, but, like, Kansas City specifically. And um, 
getting that it's 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 uh it's invaluable um because i think this this groove this beat no matter what is being played no matter harmonically what's happening where it's been uh derived from where it's being drawn from the the root of everything is going to be coming from uh this idea of the feeling of of this place and this beat that's in the place and so the the coming up in kansas city and uh uh, having an opportunity to get to uh, hear and, and sit in with and have the people yell at me for playing the wrong things or yelling at me for playing the right things or something that almost could have been. I, I think I'm still dis- discovering now, actually, the value of all that, to be honest. Right on. Well, then you move on to New York City, and then now you're in Paris, two huge hotbeds of not only jazz, but music and the arts. What was the benefit of leaving Kansas City to pursue and grow as a jazz artist? Well, you know, for me, I knew I always needed to leave Kansas City because uh, even as a, as a teenager, uh, one thing that I, I found, which, I mean, it could seem relatively dark, but keeping everything 100s, I suppose, I always found a certain level of, like, pessimism that came from, um, how do you put it, artists who are established in a city either actually commanding a certain level of respect or at least demanding uh, to have a certain command of respect because of their age, uh, not necessarily because of their actual facility on the instrument and whatnot, and just a high level of pessimism in regards to like uh, uh, what young guys are doing versus what young guys are not doing. This whole whole kind of idea of young guys. But you know, the the, the funny thing as an interjection of that idea, just to debunk it, who how old do they think Booker Little or Clifford Brown or Paul Chambers or Miles Davis? How old do they think these people were when they were revolutionizing the music? Right. It's interesting because uh, if they even checked yourself on that, then they would have to call bullshit and, and kind of swallow that all that garbage in their mouth because they were 20, mm-hmm. 18, 19. They died by the time they were 24. Some of them, Scott LaFaro, passed away, what, 24, 23? Yep. I mean, come on. Are we serious? Like. But anyway, that's enough of my interjection. Sure. So anyway, I always knew that due to this level of pessimism, as many people that weren't like that, there were enough for me to be like, this is not the place for me. Um, so I wanted to get the fuck out, basically. And so I left. And also, you know, I'm from there, so you want to leave, and that's a natural thing, too. And, you know, you get problems with the place you are. So yeah. I left, and I never really wanted to come back. Um, and I, I came back often. You know, I played. I, I did that 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 kind of thing. Uh, And I kind of had this kind of love-hate relationship with, uh, I always said it was with Kansas City, but it was never actually with Kansas City. It was just more with the idea of how I felt like my path to being able to respect that city existed when I would come back, you know? Because I would always feel kind of like an outsider. I always felt like, you know, someone from Iowa could move to Kansas City and be more respected, more known, at least even by name. More so than someone that was like actually born and bred and, and came up in like the, the actual direct inner city hood yeah. of <laughs> yep. the city, you know, yep. uh, and being a true product of the of the of the place, you know. Uh, but it, but that's how it works a lot of times, you know. And that's that's fine. I mean, I've understood that. But now, what I'm trying to say, I say all this, you know, just to be real on that level. I wanted to get out. I stayed out. Uh, it was extremely valuable because it actually let me realize all that extremely awesome things that were going on in Kansas City that we take for granted or we don't see when we're in the place. Um, and I was able to kind of understand people more and understand how paths can go in people's stories and, and to have more compassion and love just to under, of understanding. And then it, it really kind of showed me how maybe it was me that needed to change and, and to be able to see more, not not necessarily a place or, or, or a thing or, or, or people's attitudes. It's my attitude. And so um, once I was able to do this, I could respect the city more and see uh, really all of the great things that, that I was able to, to grab in New York. Because uh, New York was, uh, can, it, had it not been for the preparation, the serious preparation that I had in Kansas City, I would have not have been able to step into the East Coast in Boston for a year before getting to New York. And um, then getting to New York, and uh, man, I, when I got to New York, I had a lot of learning to do, but I was definitely ready, you know, like, no, I, there was no place that I went in New York where I couldn't hang in, in, in a situation, which means that the only way that I was prepared, and Boston the same way, So the only, and I had a lot to learn, keep in mind, a lot, and I still have a lot to learn right now, but I was prepared, and so that's one thing that I can say that, like, uh, as a... Uh, 
non-progressive in moments that people think, oh, the Midwest or blah, blah, blah kind of scenes have this kind of thing. Well, I certainly was coming from there. And I was uh, uh, stepping into uh, the most progressive scenes, and I wasn't uh, playing something that was outdated or, or not uh, uh, valid in its own way, uh, even though I definitely had my ass spanked plenty, plenty of times. Um, <laughs> let's not get that, uh, get that mis- misconstrued. That certainly happened. But um, still, at the same time, Kansas City prepared me to wait, and it gave me some other things in, in an arsenal that people didn't have. Um and um, meaning, for one, being from Kansas City, that that in itself is already a, a deep currency around the world. Any place I go and I say, I never say, I've never said I'm from New York, ever. When Even when I lived in New York, I, I've said, oh, I'm from Kansas City, you know? And so everywhere I go, I say, oh, I'm from Kansas City. It's like, oh, Kansas City. You know, it's like, because even if people think, they, even if they don't know, they think they're supposed to know, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, uh, it's cool, you know? It's yeah. like you just use it as another form of armor and whatnot. So New York really prepared me like a motherfucker. I mean, I had a chance to work with so many great people, um, I mean, it's it's and study with so many awesome people and have rehearsals and reading sessions and gigs and just man, just like a, I mean, just a myriad of people. Uh, uh, you know, that's why I, I met so many of the people that I'm working with now, and it's the reason that I'm, you know, meet and have met all these, these other folks, and you know, uh, from working with Carl Allen, you know, when I got there after studying with him and, you know, I studied with George Garzone and, and, uh, you know, uh, Mark Turner and, and Greg Osby and, and, uh, uh, you know, Gary Bartz a little bit and, and, uh, Steve Wilson, that was like a really great, uh, uh person for me, Vincent Herring, uh, uh, Greg Tardy. I mean, it's just, it's just the list go on and really the level of the relationships vary, but, were all very intense and very personal. Not to mention all the, the you know, myriad of people that I, I mean, it's just, you know, Joe Chambers. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's just Billy Hart. I mean, there's so many, so many uh, people. Um, and at, at this point, you know, um, I think like, like everything in, in, in part of how I evolved, it was always just like, well, New York's cool, but I can see this kind of like spindle, this kind of just continual cycle that you can get into. And it feels like a gel in moments where you can't get out. Um, and sometimes you can if you don't have enough money to do so and whatever else so I don't know it got to a point to where for the sake of humanity I wasn't really feeling um, uh, at the at my best I mean I probably you know towards the end of my time there I was like the heaviest in terms of like my physical health uh, that I had ever been uh, and totally probably definitely actually not healthily healthy internally and certainly not whatever was happening City. externally Sorry. but these things weren't even like the most uh, visible in fact that was probably the less visible to me and more visible was you know you go from KC to Boston to New York to Paris how have living in all of these environments contributed to the voice that you have well I think you know kind of going back to the quote of Charlie Parker where he says you know uh uh, uh, music is your life's experiences. If you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. And they had that written in the halls of Paseo, so that's why I've always remembered that quote. And it was like one of the deepest uh, things, and it's always stuck with me. And it's just simply that. Uh, I feel like uh, all the greatest artists, when I've checked out the autobiographies, uh, when I listen to the music, when I see the way uh, their, their, their uh, body of work progressed throughout the years, at least dealing with uh, 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 recorded documents, um, it seemed like they had a way of being able to truly get close to expressing their experiences through their music in, th- in current time, um, and uh, or at least the current time for them at that time. And um, for me, I just aspired to do that. I, I think um, this idea of uh, the as my life has evolved from moving and living in all these different places and, and different experiences and relationships and so on and so forth, so is my idea about what practicing is, what my relationship is with the saxophone, and simply speaking with the the, the, the relationship and the, the instrument, the being in this way. It's uh, uh, you know I don't practice the saxophone as much as we spend time together. And sure, you can say it either which way, but it really changes the whole nature of the relationship when I say you know we spend time together or we're working on our relationship. Not oh I got to go practice my no, be, because that's not what it. It is. It's, it's a relate. It's back and forth. It's uh, um, the horn is learning me, but I'm learning the horn as well. It's it's a, it's definitely. It's not just me trying to manhandle. You know that that's not how any relationship works. Or how could it possibly work that way? There has to be a submission uh, going either way. And um, 
So for me, that's helped evolve uh, my idea of like uh, you know sound and 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 spectrum of like you know composition or melody or harmony or whatever it may be. Um, so all of these things, all these places, all these experiences, these tours, this traveling, all these things have really directly contributed to the evolution of who I am and, and how I do what I do and how it comes out. It, and essentially, I still stand, stand with the main principles that, you know, one must be a, a, a study, one must be dexterous, one must be fluid, but at the same time, one must be. And so I try to just find this balance of being able to to just be as as normal and just allow everything just to happen as it does uh, without any true like dictation other than like you know just kind of having frames of trying to like keep a certain focus and um and continue to understand that the hunt of being able to be as proficient and um as uh, evolving as i've always wanted to be is always basically like the number uh number one mission and 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 the humanity inside of that being able to be human in that like uh not saying oh i'm I should spend more time. Oh, I should. No, everything is, if I didn't spend this, oh, if I decide to go drink a beer with something, fine. That's fine because I'm going to come back. And I know the relationship is fine because I'm still thinking about my breath support right now. I'm sitting in a bar. Someone's talking to me, but I'm flexing my my uh, my mouth muscles trying to, like, imagine my ambition. So if, if these things are happening, the horn is with me. I don't need the horn. To be, I mean, that's one thing George Garzon said to me uh, when I was studying with him one time. I went to his house and the saxophone was sitting on the stand. And, um, you know, I went in and I was just like, uh, I asked him something, taking out my horn. I was like, man, how, you know, how much do you practice, you know, uh, something like this. And he was like, man, you know, he's like, you see the horn over there on the stand? I was like, yeah. He was like, man, he's like, I'm practicing right now. He's like, man, I stare at this horn stays there and I just stare at it and I'm practicing. And that's all he said. And yes. I was just like, oh, okay. And I started thinking about this. And it's just, he goes back into the same evolution of living in these places as I've wanted to evolve um, as a human being. I want my relationship in terms of how I'm perceiving uh, my sound and, and evolution with the saxophone to develop the same way. And just to be, you know, be like a vocalist. That's really my goal as well, is just to really sing, you know. Uh, just want to sing, you know, that's, that's it, you know, pure melody. Right on, right on, man. So you were talking about your recent trip to Kansas City, you were at the Blue Room, but one thing you did was you recorded uh, Herman Mahari's solo album, Peter Schlam was there and a host of others. Talk to me about that experience. Oh, that was a great experience. I was really happy to get to, uh, to be a part of uh, the inside inner workings of, uh, of, of Herman's uh, machine in regards to just seeing how he runs like the full full engine. I mean, obviously we did the, uh, I was a part of the Diverse album uh, a couple years ago. And so I got to see a bit of that, but you know, that was more of a collective and everyone kind of doing the thing. And, you know, the way Herman does this thing is, you know, similar I, I find to how I do mine. It's like he gives everyone their space. He hires the people he wants because he knows they're going to do their thing and that's why he hired them. And so, but he still gets structure in terms of, you know, wanting this, wanting that. And he allows everyone to kind of like, you know, contribute in their way without any like true restriction. And I think that's a great sign of a great leader because any great leader understands that you're managing the music, but you're also at the same time managing the personalities. And, and I think that he did that excellently. I think the music came out great, um, at least from the, the playbacks that I heard. I mean, I hope certainly that, that, that Herman's happy with, uh, with what's come out, but we certainly recorded quite a bit. And um, I'm, I know that he has more than enough material. I mean, everyone sounded really, really great on the on the album. So I'm excited to hear it when it comes out. At least, uh, at least hear some some raw tracks, uh, you know, track after track. Because I only heard you know a few few playbacks in the studio. What do you think about this new generation of jazz cats in Kansas City that have come through the Bobby Watson program? Cats like Herman Mahari. How do you feel about it? Oh man, I think it's great. I mean. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's great to see because the, the whole time that I came up um, in Kansas City, that was uh, kind of the transition between, uh, I think it was Mike, it was like Mike Parkinson was there, then maybe someone took over, then Bobby, or maybe Bobby came in after Parkinson, I can't remember. But during that early, that period when I was in high school, man, none of these cats came out ever. Like, as far as I was concerned, UMKC, 
didn't even have a jazz program or anyone that played instruments there in regards to jazz because they never came to jam set. There was no scene. That no one had gigs. No one was. There was no scene. There was like you know, uh, maybe only at UMKC. I don't know. I think prior to that, it was a little different. Like the generation with like Tim Perryman's and and and, and Gerald Dunn and and uh, maybe even Dennis Winslet and like people when they were there. I think there's maybe a little bit more of the interactions. Now, um, this scene is great because uh, I feel like uh, at the time you mentioned that group with Harold, I feel like we were the only ones in our time kind of like really doing that, pushing that for a minute. Then it was like kind of like they started moving to town. We moved away. Then they developed that. Herman came and really acted like uh, the ringleader that he is and kind of really started like developing these communities of people and really pushing it and taking this business mind and really getting these things established out here in Kansas City um, and pushing that guard. And, you know, Bobby being there, obviously, like, being the one that propelled everyone to come there to be, to, to, to start with, and created this kind of youth uh, revolt, uh, not revolt, but re, uh, a revolution uh, uh, in uh, in Kansas City. Um, now, the one thing I will say that I'm sad about is that a lot of these young cats will never have the opportunity to get to meet Jay McShann or Sonny Kenner or uh, known that they should have taken more of an opportunity to get to know Ahmad al while he was still alive and around. Um, Luke Mon Hamza. Uh, I mean, the list goes on of cats that many of these cats, I bet if you even mention a name, they won't even know who the hell they are. Yeah. Now, that there's a problem with that. Um, and that's just being direct because, once again, I like talking about the history. And, you know, if you put me in a room with all of them, I would say the same exact shit, probably even a little bit more with a little bit more authority and rougher. So um, it's, uh, I feel like. Uh, if you're going to come to a place and you're going to extract the juice of a place, at the very least, you have to understand how that juice was even uh, uh, kept afloat on any level. That's, you know, I, there's no blame being put on it, but I think that I put that same uh, kind of pressure on myself. Um, now, ask me, uh, do you know all the great uh, whoever's that have come through to No, but I definitely have Art Taylor's notes and tones, and I'm checking out all the people, and I have our autobiographies I'm reading like on that level, and I'm trying to check out the expats, and I, I've gone and checked out Sonny Murray and Bobby Few and like all these great, you know, Archie Shep and these people that live here, David Murray. And so I, I definitely do my work. So it's like I don't, I'm not just like talking shit that I don't actually try to do. And so what I'm just saying is that an acknowledgement of – um, the history of that city and the players and the people that are around is important and it's something that, that definitely shouldn't be shrugged off, including someone even like Bobby Watson, um, because I think that it's interesting that he's there, but it seems like for me, I wish that there was more of a presence of, uh, of, of the city really uh, showcasing this uh, great talent uh, more. Like, I mean, at least for me, I demand more. I have no problem saying that. I'd say that to Bobby. I mean, say it to whoever. I mean, it, it's 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 just necessary and so i don't know i'm I, I love it i think there's a great thing going on you know i love peter slam that's my man i, I met peter for the first time when he was 17 he came up to new york because uh, we have a mutual friend by the name of danny share who's from st louis and he knew peter and so on and so forth and so that's how we met and peter was killing in he's always been like a little little just like progressive just crazy crazy musician um uh, really nice guy um, and him and Peter, or him and uh, Herman, obviously, are, are, are good friends from a long, from a long time since high school or something like this. So um, I'm really happy that, that this thing is forming and it's really strong, and they're really doing a really great job. They actually made me really excited about coming back to Kansas City. This last time I was there, I have to say, seeing what they're doing and seeing how they're really pushing the guard. But I always say that more can be done, and that's my only thing is that I don't want to see uh, 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 people getting lax. You know, I had a, a chance to work with a great stage director here in Paris. He was doing, we were doing a play for for about a year. His name is uh, uh, um, uh, Bob Bob uh, Bob Wilson or Robert Wilson, who's a you know a famous New York uh, stage director. Whatever he's doing this thing here. And one thing he always said that I always found that was super hip. And one reason he didn't like, he got tired of like French or he had problems with French actors sometimes is because they wouldn't keep the tension. And his whole thing is keep the tension. And so it makes sense, like, because I find that all the greatest art, right, all the greatest music, even when cats had uh, great careers, um, the ones that kept pushing, the ones that kept pushing, um, no matter what, you know, and the problem sometimes with people that have great careers and they have whatever, they have whatever status is that even if the albums are good, they're like, ah, uh, but it's not, uh, that's because they stopped pushing the tension. It's like there's a, there's a certain tension. And so I want to make sure that everyone's still is staying tense. 
Like, you know, to have this great scene happen in Kansas City, but act like you have no gigs. Act like you, you're not playing four times a day and making great money a month. Act like you push. Like, uh, and I think that's going on. And that's that's what I'm saying. I love it, and I want to see more of it. And, and I really hope that they keep moving that way, because I'm saying really soon, based off the way that I see Kansas City expanding and the way that I see this scene expanding, Kansas City is about to be a metropolis. It already is a metropolis right now, and and it's gonna be, it's gonna get, it's gonna get extremely crazy because New York is about to bust. It's way too expensive, and people absolutely cannot afford to live there anymore. Yeah. So they're gonna have to move, and people are knowing that Kansas City's popping right now. Everyone knows. They know everyone's playing. People got gigs. Uh, there's more and more clubs opening, not closing. Uh, it's I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You better watch out because I think Kansas City's already back. It's not even like coming back. I think Kansas City's already like. It, it, I had a really great impression of Kansas City the last time I was there. I have to say, beautiful, really, really great. That's beautiful, man. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. There's, I, as I always say, it's a real renaissance going down right now, for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, man. Every in every way, man. Really hip venues opening up. Yeah, you know, I went to that barcade place. I went to this, you know, all these wine, you know, uh, fusion kind of place. Like, whoa, you know, it's really, really, really crazy. Places in Kansas City where my whole life it was always just like. Com- of desolate, not quite industrial, but man, it's like all these little spots open. It's like, wow, okay, all right, makes me want to buy a place and, and do, do do something of my own in Kansas City. Right on, man. That'd be perfect. We'd love that. Let me. I'm going to bring everything down locally to you. This is my final question. Everybody has a perception of Logan Richardson. Your family, your friends, your business associates, the people that you play for. But I want to know from you, who do you think you are when you wake up in the morning and you face who you are? Who who do you think you are? Man, you know, that's such a you know, kind of the, the eternal question. Um I I think that I just aspire to be someone that that uh that <laughs> that kind of exists in a space that I will probably never know exactly who I am because I'm always constantly searching for who I am. And I think that um if I were to know who I was, then that would basically mean that my life was, was over in a sense, because then what am I hunting for? Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Beautiful. I love that answer. Logan, thank you for giving me your time. Thank you for the music. I appreciate uh, your, your thoughtful answers and, and giving me your time, man. I really appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your time and, and listening to me uh, chatter and ramble as I have a bad tendency to do. No, man, you're speaking the truth. That's all That's all I heard. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Logan for his time, his honesty, and all of those great stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things neon jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Jazz.